Tyson, it is great to see your face today. Welcome to Business Not As Usual. How are you doing? Thank you very much for having me on. I'm doing well in spite of the circumstances. How are you today? I'm actually very, very well and very excited to talk to you. So for those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about your journey. I've had a very exciting and very privileged journey. I used to call myself a wine writer. Now I refer to myself more as a wine communicator because I think the way in which I'm able to share the wine world is more than just writing. I first published my well, my very first wine book way back in 2002, and the journey has entailed 16 different books over that time with a focus around Australian wines and more recently Champagne, including six editions of the Champagne Guide, and that has led me to judging wine shows and to presenting radio, television series, and increasingly in recent years to hosting events and tours, the biggest global champagne showcase events around the world, webinars and all sorts, and quite an exciting journey to share the wonderful stories of the world of wine. Tyson, I love that you just said wine communicator because I feel like so many people can relate to that and we're having to pivot and transcend platforms continuously. So can you talk me through a little bit about from books to events and how things have been impacted in the crazy year that has been 2020. Yeah, hasn't it been a crazy year? And I guess that's emphasised to the diversity of what I'm doing. I've, I've never liked the term wine critic because I think it's too negative. And even journalist has all sorts of connotations to it. So to me, it's about communication. And a year like this has really forced me back down to the fundamentals of what I'm really on about because way back in March when the world locked down, those of us who are in the industries of entertainment, the arts, hospitality and tourism, I think were most affected. And for me, my business precariously straddles all four of those spheres, hosting tours, hosting events, travel, presenting. And so all of a sudden, the things that I would normally do on a day-to-day basis were literally shut down overnight. And I've worked very hard over the past two decades to diversify my business. So I'm hosting events in Hong Kong, UK, US, New Zealand, all across Australia. And in a year like last year, when things were difficult in Hong Kong, that's okay. I'll focus events in the UK where things are going well. And in a year when it's difficult to do things in the US, I can do more in Australia and so forth. But to have a situation as every industry has experienced this year, where that's not possible in any country, threw me into a tailspin. Two weeks um, before I was to host my biggest ever event, which is Taste Champagne, and it was to be in London, um, the whole of the world was put in shutdown. So that event was suddenly postponed and the lead up to that was massive. A year of planning, a £100,000 event that I self-fund where we have 50 or 60 champagne houses presenting in a massive room hundreds of public tickets sold, hundreds of trade coming. We were hosting four masterclasses across the day. We printed the tasting book in China, printed it months in advance. It's 120 pages, full colour. Every wine that's been shown in the room is listed. Every one of those bottles was delivered to our storage um, partners in the UK. Everything was locked and loaded, ready to go, and then um, shut down. That process to me was something that was obviously quite emotional. It, Every little success in the lead up to these events is exciting, and then to the whole, put the whole thing on hold really threw me into a, 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 a real grief process. And I, I recognized in myself that the, the loss over hopes and dreams that comes through that takes days to come to terms with. You go through the standard, talk about the standard stages of grief um, denial, anger, um, disappointment, and then ultimately acceptance. And, I recognise that that process took me about three or four days to get through when something is as dramatic as that occurs. But the challenge of this year is the roller coaster of it because I've also had dozens of dinners and interstate tastings events, I host wine shows, and progressively, like one domino falling after another throughout the, the kind of six months of, of COVID to date, it's been one event after another that has fallen away. And so the whole process of grief and loss <laughs> reiterates itself and I'm a pretty, pretty resilient person and going through that a few times is good 
And I pray I can deal with this. I've got a good supportive network around me. Um, but when that happens so many times, as it's happened for me and so many of my peers and colleagues throughout the arts and entertainment and hospitality industries, it only takes its top. And that's hard work to deal with. Yeah, thank you for sharing so openly about that. I'm sure many people will relate to you. It's interesting, as you were talking about the diversification of your business over the years, looking from the outside in, you would almost say, well, you've already future-proofed your business across bricks and mortar and digitization to a large degree. Talk to me about London as the first of many events that you had to deal with and go through those phases of grief. What did you actually do? You've already sold all these tickets. You've got all this stock de- delivered. Everything's about to happen and suddenly the world closes down. What were the steps that you took to move forward through that? My events manager, Jody and I put into to motion um, <laughs> very much a, a day-by-day process, some things you can't plan in advance. And as, as people who are quite organised and quite structured, we like to be able to plan things well in advance and, we recognise this year that we really need to play every day as it comes and adapt and be agile and able to diversify on a day-to-day basis. So on, on managing these events, we immediately put into place procedures whereby we could ensure that we're looking after all the stakeholders in these events, first and foremost. That means that um, we, we put messages out to all of our exhibiting agents and all of our public and all of our trade guests and said and tried to be open about our communication, firstly, as transparent as possible in these uncertain times, and to assure them that um, we would guarantee delivery of what we promised. That means if they need a refund on tickets, we would grant that if they were happy to accept the credit and we ask them to please be with us, support us. Um, if you can take a credit, it means that we don't have the refund, which is in itself a cost of the process, and allows us then to maintain the resources to be able to reschedule the event when things open up sufficiently to do that. So for us, the priority in all of this is to make sure that we are showing integrity and delivering what we've offered to our stakeholders, partners and wonderful supporters who've given us incredible support around the world over many years and something which is worth far more to us than a ticket here or there. Which is, I think, why communication being part of your title is key. How supportive did you find? Because I know there's been so many people in hospitality, wine, you know, venues, the weddings, events, industry, entertainment, as you mentioned, who've all come up with this issue. You're dealing with issues around cash flow and mindset and supply chain and a whole myriad of other things. Did you find on the whole that people were supportive? I was amazed. When we had to shut down these events, I thought we are looking down the barrel of a major catastrophe financially for us because... The investment in an event like Taste Champagne London, as one example, what we do was about £100,000, which I self-funded. But because we're still establishing that event, it's only its second year, we're pretty much hoping to break even in terms of costs and, and income. But by having to postpone, suddenly the costs skyrocket because you have to <laughs> reprint the books and get them sent from China. My events manager has months and months more work and so forth. And I thought, we are in trouble if everybody demands a refund. And even if 50% of our guests demand a refund, we're in trouble. And I expected that a large majority would expect the refund because we had to postpone for three months, then six months, then 12 months. But I've been greatly encouraged, as I know many others have in the entertainment industry, how supportive people are and prepared to say, yes, we want to support you and we will accept a credit and um, when the time comes, we look forward to attending the event. So I've been... It's been a real moral support to have people say, yeah, we're behind you, we're going to stick with you, we're on the journey with you and we're prepared to stay on board and leave our deposit with you or leave our full payment with you and let's do the event as soon as we can. But testament to you too, Tyson, I think there's been so many people who just ceased communication with their suppliers and, you know, that can potentially have a real adverse effect long term. How did you communicate with them all and how are you continuing to do so throughout this process? We're really fortunate to have a good system set up and we use MailChimp as a, a back-end kind of mailing system and we've got very detailed sets of audiences there so that we're, as soon as we launch a new event, we can communicate that out and invite them along. When we've got updates to events, if they need to know how the parking works for something, they get updates about that in advance. So we're fortunate to have a system that was already ready for continuous communication. We thought it's really important to keep people in the loop along the process and even though we haven't always at every stage known exactly when and how we can postpone, 
obviously we still don't know that even in eight months later, we are able at least to reach out to people and say, this is where we're at. This is what we're thinking. These are our priorities. We're going to make sure we ensure this. This is what we can guarantee. This is this is where we're a bit uncertain about dates, but let's aim for this and let's make sure we can come through this and celebrate together. Just doing that by emails and um, giving people a chance to make sure that they are at least in the loop on what we're thinking and bring them along for the journey. Mm. And that means that we update our website regularly too with little statements around what we're doing with the events that we are, again, able to start to plan. We ensure that we have rewritten our policies regarding refunds so people can feel confident that if they're investing in one of our events and, for instance, if the event's still able to go ahead but they can't make it because their particular borders and shut down, then they can be sure that they'll, they'll have um, no loss of funds through that. And when people do ask for a refund... We um, fortunately set up with credit card systems that we need to supply that straight back to credit cards and make sure that happens in a timely way too. Yeah, extraordinary. And so in regards to events moving forward, I think you've actually taken a lot of them online. You're doing a lot of them virtually. Tell me about mm-hmm. that and if people are being receptive to it and do you think that'll be somewhat of the model for the future? When we first came up against the whole shock of COVID shutdown, it really forced me to go back to the fundamentals of what am I on about? And I thought previously I'm, I'm really on about bringing people together and having events and, and connecting them with champagne in a way that we can do through tours to take them there direct, through big events like Tay Champagne, through intimate dinners. But as soon as all of those things were off the cards, it forced me back to the fundamentals. And I'm not actually on about tours and live events. I'm on about connecting people and on about making opportunities for people to have a meaningful link and relationship with some of the greatest chef de carbs in Champagne and some of the greatest winemakers in Australia. But more than that, to be able to link them together as wine lovers and bring them together in a way that they can interact. And while that happens naturally and in a wonderful way through tours and, and dinners where you sit around the same table and eat and drink together, I was really quite nervous about the way in which we could translate that across to a world in which we're not able to have the same physical connection. And yes, you can talk to people over a camera as we're doing now, but how do you, how do you taste the wine together in that way? How do you enjoy food together? So I hosted my first webinar way back in March with the wonderful Cyril Brown of the, the amazing house of Charles Hightech. And we had about 80 people tuning in that night. And, and since that time, we've had hundreds tuning in from nine different countries all around the world. The thing that amazed me in that interactive experience, having 80 people, like you, you can't put 80 faces on the screen at once. So it was just Cyril and myself and everybody else had the chance to interact through the chat window and through the Q&A. The thing that amazed me was that suddenly these people in our network who've been supportive of our tours and dinners for years wanted to be supportive of these webinars, not just to support us, but because they yearn to still be connected to these chef de cards and still taste the wine. So we set it up in such a way that they weren't watching us taste because that would be the most boring thing ever. <laughs> so to make sure that our guests can have a glass of champagne in hand, it's going to be Friday night, it's going to be 8 o'clock that we do this. They're locked down at home. They're going to enjoy this experience, not watching us drink, but actually drinking themselves. So we thought, how can we be clever with that and set it up such that we're not only supporting the champagne houses themselves, but the whole chain that's fallen over like dominoes in this process because all of a sudden the importers of these wines in Australia have lost their customer base. The independent retailers and chain stores are losing out on sales because during COVID people instantly bought up big on wine, yes, but it was lower price. And champagne sparkling was the hardest hit category and champagne the hardest hit in the sparkling category. Sales plummeted not only because a large amount of champagne is sold through events, hotels, airlines, but also because this is celebration wine and people aren't celebrating when they're in lockdown. So we thought, how can we support every stage of this industry process to what we're doing? And the answer was that in setting up our webinars, we made connection with all the importers and said, okay, let's work on a set of wines that you've got available right now and let's talk about key retailers in every capital city and every regional centre which stocked these wines. So we set it up such that the wines were shipped to each city so all of our guests had access to them. We promoted those retailers out in promoting the webinars. The retailers then reciprocated and helped to promote the webinars for us among their clientele. And people bought the wines, sometimes one or two bottles, sometimes three or four, 
that they tasted with us. So we're able to set up a situation where everybody was tasting the same wines, where everybody had the chance to interact, ask questions. And then the thing that amazed me the most in that process was that, for instance, someone was having a birthday, so I raised cheers to them. All of a sudden, in the, in the, the little comments section, there are all of these people around Australia, around the world, wishing happy birthday to Jane in Adelaide or Jimmy in Perth. And these people would email me later and say, it was just the most wonderful thing to be able to celebrate my birthday with people all around the world. And what a warm and inviting atmosphere. Instantly, we had transferred the, the same collegiality, the same intimacy, the same connection from tours and tastings and dinners into this impersonal, digital kind of anti-social media monster that it can sometimes be. I realised it can actually be a special and intimate and connected place. And all those fundamental things that I was trying to achieve, as hard as they might be to do over a camera, snapped into place straight away. Not, not thanks to me or the Chef de Carves necessarily, but thanks to the wonderful expectation that our guests all around the world were able to bring to this in setting the atmosphere and creating that themselves. And that was such a blessing to me and such a blessing to Jody, such a blessing to the Chef de Carves too, who were in lockdown suffering in the same way as us and suddenly able to engage with the audience that they know and love and connect with them. And there's something quite morally empowering about that. Oh, Tyson, that was just such a beautifully uplifting story. I can feel your energy through the screen as you're talking about it. And what just struck me as something really interesting was I kept seeing statistics about how, you know, alcohol consumption had gone up, but I didn't really think about, you know, the premium side of things and champagne. So it's quite extraordinary that you were able to talk to everyone along the supply chain and really make that work and make it such a beautiful, connected experience, which we only often feel in venues. So speaking of venues, we all love our food and wine venues, and so many of those have been shut down this year, and it's been really, really hard for so many people, and I really feel for them continuously. Are there any other extraordinary kind of pivots or innovations or things that you've witnessed that you'd like to talk about? I have the privilege of working with many amazing hotels, restaurants, event spaces, and, and wonderful people around the world. And like you say, the way in which they've been hit by COVID has been just drastic, and I really feel for our friends in places that have been hit the hardest, especially in Melbourne right now as we're recording, which is still heavily in lockdown. As other cities are emerging, it's exciting to see the way in which people are supporting these venues. But even during lockdown, uh, perhaps the one that inspired me most was a venue that I work closely with here in Brisbane. Claire and Shannon Kellum at the great restaurant Monashay were one of the very first to offer a full takeaway kind of warm it up yourself at home menu. And I was only speaking with them about this when we hosted our first live event with them again just last week after eight months of, of hosting virtual events. And Claire said to me that they, they planned very carefully, even before lockdown started, they already had all of the procedures in place ready to start a process of basically takeaway effectively during lockdown even to the point of contacting all the key food and wine media in Brisbane and saying, when we go into lockdown, if we go into lockdown, we are going to be delivering takeaway as a special menu in this way, with little video prepared snippets on how to do the final prep at home and this is how you'll order and everything else, such that as soon as lockdown did happen, all of those media who needed the story could say, here's a showcase for how this is done. And I thought, how clever and insightful is that? And how much can we all think in this time when we're constantly evolving and constantly having to be agile about thinking about how we're going to change, what are we going to do differently, to actually think ahead and say, okay, here are some scenarios. If lockdown goes this way, if it goes that way, if the world opens up in this way, what can I be doing? How can I be planning now in order to do that? I heard a historian talking about the reason that we had the Great Depression after World War I, but actually quite a good time of economic success after World War II the reason that they put to that was simply that the world leaders learned from World War I and had all the processes for recovery in place during World War II long before the world ever ended. Whereas in World War I, that wasn't the case and hence the Great Depression and so forth. I wonder too if each of us in our businesses on a small level can be better, and I certainly need to be thinking about it, better prepared for what we might be doing not in two weeks' time, but in six months' time or two years' time. We don't know what's going to happen in the world, but we kind of had a bit of an idea of different directions that it's going to go in. How can we best place ourselves then and how can we best be 
prepared now in order to do that. You know, I think what you just said is so pertinent and you mentioned it earlier on about purpose, you know, very simply, what's your purpose? What are you here to do? And I think what's interesting is so many of us have been turbocharged into this, you know, way of thinking differently, innovating, pivoting (laughs) on the spot. So what would you say to people? Are there three kind of simple tips about how to future proof? You know, we don't know what's going to come next. There's so much uncertainty. Are there three things that stand out to you just to to gear people up for what the future may look like? Mm. The things that have really made the biggest difference for me this year and and I realise that it's true every year, it's not just this year, but perhaps in times of, of extreme extremes like this, you really come back to those fundamentals. The first one is the importance of relationship. And by that I mean how is my network, how are my connections with the people who are important to me, both as suppliers and as consumers, do I have a relationship with them that they look to me and they trust me? And if that's the case, I've seen time and time again this year for my business and others, I've been... <laughs> moved to tears countless times been a bit emotional now because the way in which people supported me this year has been just incredible and I, I, I never really took that for granted but I've perhaps never seen it articulated quite so significantly not only through events and webinars but ordinarily throughout the year I put out a number of small ebooks and they're just free and people can download them but this year I thought under the circumstances I'll put out a pay your own price option on this so that if people don't have the means to be able to pay for this. They can have it for free with my full blessing, and I stated this in the explanation. But if they're in a financial situation, many are still financially doing well at the moment. Some industries are, uh, have really haven't been affected by COVID negatively at all. Some are doing better than ever. If you're in a position to pay for it, then, then I really appreciate that, especially this year. The amount that people have paid, have paid has just been incredible and, and really made a difference to my cash flow this year. So to be able to go back to the fundamental relationships, which ultimately business is all about, has been a key for me in coming through. And I know that's been the case for many winemakers and cellar doors and restaurants too. So that's my first point, that valuing relationship and the people around us and acknowledging that. I send a personal thanks to every single person who buys my um, any of my ebooks on a pay-your-own price now. Some of the notes that I'm really grateful for this. Thank you. So to try to acknowledge that. So that's my first thing. The second one um, that's significant is, as we've already said, to, to go back to fundamentals. What am I ultimately on about? How can I achieve what I'm fundamentally here as my ultimate purpose in life? How can I achieve that in a world in which perhaps the usual means of doing that no longer exist? And that's helped me to be able to find ways to move forward that are um encouraging to me too and, and, and build resolve and motivation because I'm still doing what I fundamentally need to do even if it's not my daily routine of what I'd ordinarily want to do. The, the third thing that I would suggest as being significant for me this year is to be prepared to do things differently mm. and to be agile enough to be able to change and that's different for some businesses than others, but I know big businesses who can do that quickly and small businesses who sometimes do it slowly. So I think it's as much a mindset as anything, and obviously some industries are better here, but unfortunate I don't have lots of bricks and mortar and I don't have big teams of staff. I'm small and agile. Um, but to be able to be open enough to offer things and to ask as well. I mean, I've gone into my audience multiple times. You're not everybody. To keep people who I know um, are well tuned in, both suppliers and my audience of customers and said, what do you need this year? What can I do that might help you out? What are, what are the points, what are the things you're missing? And one person in Tasmania said, we haven't had a, a sparkling or champagne dinner in Tasmania for a long time. Why don't you come down here and do one? So a plain one. It's been postponed once, but it will happen. It's scheduled for February now on the basis of this one person saying, we feel we really need this. I'm just trying to listen more than usual and tune in to the points of need and offer opportunities for people that meet a need. So many amazing tips there. Thank you. I want to loop back on valuing relationships. And I think I just want to ask you a little bit about The art of storytelling. I mean, so many winemakers just have such beautiful, incredible stories and we fall in love with, you know, the vineyards and everything they've done. What have you seen through this time um, to keep the art of storytelling alive for winemakers and in the hospitality industry in general? Posted 14 webinars so far this year. We've got another four scheduled this year and another four into next year. 
And the way in which each of those webinars brings out the stories of the people behind it has moved me to test countless times and the responses that we get from our audiences are incredible because we have people and it's always the principal or the winemaker, someone who's key to that organisation who really has some hide in the game in this situation, able to share with us their own experiences and to be able to take that further too. A good example is the wonderful Natalie Fryer who makes a wine called Bellabon in northern Tasmania she makes literally two or 3,000 bottles a year. It's tiny, tiny. A lot of her market has disintegrated in the wake of COVID because she was selling larger to restaurants. And we were able to set up webinars and introduce her to some retailers around the country who were supporting our webinars, which she hadn't sold before, and they're now taking repeat orders. So it's great to see her into, into to those new markets. And to be able to sit in front of a camera with her at 8 o'clock on a Friday night over a few glasses of her wine, and to hear just what she's gone through this year and the way in which this year has impacted her, she was so open about the struggle she's been through, the affirmation that she gets from seeing her wines loved by the people out there. For all of our audience to be able to taste her wine and support her, there is a real building. We could keep coming back to this word of connection. And I think in times of social isolation, we need to build ways to better connect with each other. And for us to be able to share Natalie's story not so much about what she's doing with vineyards and wine, although they certainly did that too, but to share the story of, of how it's significant for her to, to link in with her audience and have the chance to connect with them. We're doing another webinar with her later this year off the back of that because it was such a wonderful time. Our audience was really able to say that they they, they felt a, a real rapport with Matt through that experience because she was so open and so honest. And one of the things I love about winemakers, there's, there's lots of pretense in the hospitality industry, but... There's none of my winemakers. They're basically farmers. They're battling the elements on a day-to-day -day basis. They're, they're growing plants and pressing the wines into grapes, uh, grapes into wine, sorry. Um, and they, they're really honest about that. And I love the way in which there's such an authenticity about the wine industry and such a privilege for me to be able to share that and tell those stories. And to be honest, quite often with my webinars, I'll have a list of questions over here that I'm ready to ask. I guess we'll ask a lot of questions. I don't say a lot. I'm just there to basically provide the opportunity for the winemakers to connect with the audience. And that's important for me too. It's not about me. I'm not the hero. I'm simply the messenger. And the winemakers are the stories and the heroes and the people that we really want to support through this. Well, nice segue because today I'm the messenger, literally. <laughs> so, so how can we support winemakers there'll be a lot of people watching this webinar and you give so selflessly of yourself thank you how can we the community watching this actually support winemakers and and do more do our bit out there i love those messages that came through as covid really hit and they really followed in australia off the back of the incredible season that we saw bushfires and droughts as well which actually decimated the industry even more than bushfires and in some ways covid the messages that came through then of Buy direct, because the winemakers will make the best margin if you buy direct from them. Buy local. Buy from the people you want to support, the people you most want to keep buying from when we come through all this. It's not only because you are buying their product and having their cash buy, all those things are obvious, but also the fact that, and I see this all the time, because I receive every order that comes through for one of my events or one of my tours or anything comes to me personally, and I forward it on to JD, my events manager, to reply, but I see them all, and it's so encouraging just to see an email and orders being received uh, at a time when you know we're all worried about the cash flow and everything else to be able to physically see that. And I know winemakers who talk about the fact that they've just been so affirmed, even winemakers who had vineyards obliterated by bushfires, for them to get this deluge, if you like, of support in orders the next week, it's so it's so mo morale building for them to be able to receive that. So I encourage people, the challenge now is that there's a massive tail on this thing. We don't know if COVID's going to be over in two months or two years or five years. We have no idea. And while it's very easy when COVID first hit, to be able to, yes, I'm going to support my local restaurants by buying take I'm going to support the winemakers I love most who aren't in retail by buying from the direct. I'm really going to make an effort to do that. That was great. And we did that well at the start. The thing is now we're eight months in. What are we doing in 12 months? What are we doing in 16 months? These guys are in the same position that they were in terms of struggling to be able to maintain supply chains during lockdown and so forth. I encourage people to continue to stay in touch with the suppliers you love the most, the restaurants, the arts, the hospitality, tourism, catering and winemakers, of course, 
and look to what they need most. And often that is going to be continuing to buy from the direct, continuing to you know send them little bits of encouragement in any way that you can. Maintain connection, stay connected with us because we're all in this together and we all need to maintain the best ways that we can to support each other. Thank you. I think there's so much simple messaging there and beautiful messaging. And you're right. Anyone who owns a small business, you know, we see something pop up on Shopify and it affects us personally. And I think it means so much. And I think, as you say, we're all here for the long term. To, so keep keep supporting, keep asking the questions. How can we help? And I'm sure people will be unafraid to tell us. Now, Tyson, who or what do you turn to for support? <laughs> I'm so blessed, Lisa. There are there are so many amazing people and the wine industry is a small place and it has a lot of wonderful people who are very well connected and I'm very blessed to have a lot of connections around Australia, not only among winemakers but also among sommeliers and wine trade, wine buyers and all around the world. As I mentioned, we've had 82 different independent retailers we've been able to support with these events and they support back by helping to promote what we're doing. So I love the, the chance to be able to go to people who are in this together and I learned so much from other people. And, in fact, the whole idea for me starting webinars didn't come from the wine industry at all. One of my other activities is that I have established and, and run a foundation called the Team Rescue Foundation, and that is set up to be able to provide the wine industry with ways of physically funding the amazing volunteer organisations that are putting resources on the ground to support teenagers at the vulnerable time of their lives in school these weeks, university, our weeks, concerts, festivals, all sorts, sports events about being responsible about alcohol. And the, the legend who set up the Red Frogs, which is the most active of the initiatives that are going out to those young people, his name's Andy Goulet. He's been a friend for many years. And when COVID hit, Andy called me up and he said, how are you doing, mate? What's going on? And I said, oh, I have no idea what's going on. And how are you? And he said, look, we're just, we're taking all of our presentations and events we normally do in schools and we're starting these online virtual things. And he said, you should try that. I said, you know, that's a really good idea. So I went away, talked to Jody about that, and that gave birth to what is now a series of 22 webinars. So it's amazing the way in which some of those casual conversations, he was just calling me up to see how I was going, but he inspired me to start something that's turned into quite an incredible diversification of my business and, and really been the driver behind my ability to keep Jody on as an employee this year because, well, we're, we're all on JobKeeper and that's, that's been a real blessing, but it's enabled us to have enough not only to keep ourselves employed, but also to maintain those connections so that our audience can still tap into the great wines and the great people of Champagne on a week-to-week -week basis. Tyson, I feel like you have every box ticked. You're coming at it from every single angle holistically. Um, please say hi to Andy from Red Frogs. I used to do some work with them years and years ago and it's high time that I got back involved. So that is something really good to put back on my radar. This is yeah, probably... Right. Amazing organisation. I recommend everyone to look them up and to see what they're doing. It's incredible what they're doing around the world right now. Very, very powerful. I agree. Now, this may be a, a very big question to end on, given everything that's happened this year and also the existing diversification of your businesses. But what's next? <laughs> <laughs> Just a small question. Yeah, it's a, it's a big question. And the answer on, in one way is I don't know. In another way, I've, I've got all manner of, of things in motion. So, I'm very conscious that at a time like this, we need to be agile and changing on a week-to-week -week basis. So while webinars are a massive focus for me for the last six months, going forward, I've gone from having a webinar every week or two to now having webinars just every month because I'm looking constantly, what are people able to do? What do people want to do? Webinars are great and I'll continue doing webinars because all of a sudden I've been able to tap into an audience in nine countries and people in remote places who can't come to my events who still want to stay connected. So there's a new avenue there that will continue. But at the same time, too, I can't host my big global sort of taste champagne events yet, but I can host masterclasses. So next month I've got two masterclasses. I can sit down format, which is okay under COVID. I can space people apart. I can give them a lot of insight into the wines. They're physically there, so it's not a webinar. So it's one step further on from what I was doing. I haven't done masterclasses like that in Australia really at all. So that's something different. But going into next year, I'm looking at it and thinking, what, what are the best opportunities to meet people's needs in a way that is possible under COVID? So let's start playing some interstate events again. I'm looking at rebooting my champagne tours, relaunching those as soon as I'm able. 
taste champagne, what happened again? It might be slightly different format, but as soon as they're able to do that in each of the countries, I've got taste champagne on the cards. Singapore and Japan for the first time, New York for the first time when the opportunity opens up. So I've actually got a lot more irons in the fire than I can keep up with. I've been invited and accepted the position of, of the editor of James Halliday's Australian Wine Companion this year. I wouldn't have time for that ordinarily, but going forward, um, I've, I've kind of got about three times as many things on the cards as I could possibly keep up with. If they all come off, I need to find some more staff to help me. If they don't all come off, I'll do the ones I can. Um, so in a way, I've kind of pushed on every door, kept every door open and gone, right, let's go hard. And if a few of those doors close, that's okay because I've still got so many others open. So it's a little bit daunting for somebody who wants to have everything covered and organised, but at the same time just keeping everything open and finding ways to go forward that allow me to adapt and evolve. And in six months' time, things will be different again, but we'll find some ways to just continue to keep people connected, inspired and enjoying the great wines of the world. Well, speaking of connected and inspired, Tyson, thank you so much for this extraordinary chat you obviously care so much about your community about the hospitality and wine industry the fact that you got quite emotional a couple of times just is testament to truly how much you are doing and thank you also for sharing so much about your diversification and how you've really tried to digitize a lot through this time this has been very very informative and i look forward to connecting again soon thank you lisa god can i just encourage too if anybody's tuning into this and um, finds that they have questions or comments coming off the back of it, that um, all my details are online. If you Google me, you'll find me. I'd love to hear from you. And um, if we can learn from each other and I can help anybody, as many people have helped me, then I'm certainly keen to do that. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Extraordinary. Thank you.